with myself and one assistant um, in 2010, I kind of started peeking out where I couldn't do any more any more business by myself without additional, let's say, agents. Um, I closed 183 properties that year. Um, I was good. I was good. I was a 90%, 90% were listings, 10% were buyers. Pretty much every buyer I had and every buyer call, I just kept referring it out to other agents because I, I just wanted to drive those listings as hard as I could. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And they have no idea how much you care because they've never met you. So right now they're all listening to the same radio station. What's in it for me? WYFM. So they want to know, can this guy get my family the best value, the best money, the highest sales price, whatever that looks like, you know, protect my equity. And can they make it as stress-free as possible? That's it. That's what people want to know. Right? So evidence of success with the sold, the stress free in the review and the money in the stat, just nailing the psychology of it. And then once you're in front of them, then you start into your Ford conversation, right? Family, occupation, recreation, dream. And that's where you win the hearts and the minds. Mastermind Agent is proud to present success calls. Top real estate agents from across North America reveal their success secrets, strategies, and systems in up-close and personal interviews. You can find all the calls at www.mastermindagent.com. Hi, I'm Mike Cerrone with Mastermind Agent, and welcome to Success Calls. This month's top agent is Michael Perna with Keller Williams in Novi, Michigan. Welcome to the call, Michael. You betcha. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. I appreciate you having me on this, this, uh, this month. Michael, this is fantastic. I'm real excited to talk to you and learn more about your business today. First question I have for you, though, before we talk about what you're doing today, let's go back for a minute and talk about what you did before you got into real estate. Absolutely. And I, I, thought, I honestly thought your first question was going to be, are you wearing pants? Uh, <laughs> right. That's the new one today, isn't it? In a Zoom webinar. Yep, yep. Um, and I am, by the way. I am. <laughs> Um, so before, and that's a great question. So before real estate, and I, I've been selling full time for, it, it'll be, it'll be 20 years actually this fall. Um, I was honestly a bartender and finishing up, uh, uh my undergrad and grad degree, which I never actually finished my grad degree, but, um, I was in college. I was a college student, you know, I was bartending full time. I was looking for a way to, uh, to pay for pay the student bills without actually having to take a student loan. Cause I was watching a lot of friends drown. I, was, I saw my mother sell some homes. Um, she was a real estate agent for eight years. Um, did fantastic. I mean, she, she was averaging seven fifty, eight hundred thousand 800000 a month with no assistant, no marketing, just all referral, just kind of happened and came to her. So I looked at that and I said, okay, I can definitely handle that. And uh, uh, it, it was definitely a lot different than what I thought. You, you were a bartender. You were in college. And I was going to ask why you got into real estate. Was it because of your mom or what was, the, why did you get a license? Uh, a little bit of both. So the, the number one reason was I wanted to graduate with no student debt. Um, and I found bartending was not going to, win. it wasn't going to do it. It wasn't going to do it. I wasn't making enough a year to, to pull that one off. Um, and I saw my mother, her average sales price was in the, in the 360, 370 range um, without having any real overhead that I was aware of it seemed like, okay, if I do just one house a month in addition to what I'm currently doing, or even two homes a month in addition to what I'm currently doing, that could work. Um, and I honestly didn't realize how much work was involved, what it would take to <laughs> so Your mom made it look too easy. She did. And she also took all my family. So <laughs> right. I got in real estate and the first thing she said was, you can be a real estate agent, but you just can't be one here at the same brokerage I am. So you need to go somewhere else. So I did. And then she said, oh, by the way, your aunts, your uncles, your cousins, they're all off limits. They're mine. <laughs> there goes your spear. <laughs> I'm like, all right, that's well, okay. Okay, that works. Yeah. yeah. So uh, what year were you in college? How old were you when you got this license? Uh, that'd be 2000, 2001. I got the license. 2002, I actually started selling. And how old were you at that time? Uh, 22. So you were 22 years old. And, uh, and you couldn't use your spear, your mom's spear, your family. So how did you find business that first year? Yeah. So 
So the first year, and I apologize, I was 20 when I got licensed, but I didn't actually really start selling until the following year. The first six months um, in the business, um, I sold one home, complete fluke. Someone had walked through an open house and said, I need to sell my home. It was the, it was one of the two worst transactions of my career. It was a hoarder. It was, I had no idea how to deal with it. Um, it was actually the lady's dad that owned the home. So I didn't understand title. I didn't understand anything along those lines. Um, they shut off the utilities three days before closing. And that was in January. So all the pipes burst. So during the final walkthrough, I get the call from the other agent. Hey, the pipes burst. And I'm like, I don't know what that means. I don't understand the ounces. I don't understand any of this. And there's like, well, there's six feet of water in the basement. I'm like, now I get it. Wait a minute. That means I'm not getting paid. Okay. 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 Got it. I really needed that check. I really needed that check. It was like four months into the business with, with no income. Um, yeah, and come to find out, the buyer still wanted the house, which was awesome, and was willing to accept whatever the payout was from insurance, whatever that, which which ended up being, I think, sixty five or seventy thousand. Um, it just lowered the price by that amount, and he was more than willing and happy to do all the work. So I was like, okay, I got super lucky on that. Um, the second six months in the business was pretty good. I doubled my business. I sold two homes, um, which is awesome. I, I always love to say that I doubled my business. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's positioning. It's all positioning. Um, and again, I almost got out. I, 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 again, I had the worst transaction ever. Um, this gentleman who, who was a, uh, uh, he was a bouncer and an MMA fighter that was a personal contact of mine. He bounced at, at, a, at a bar that I bartended at. Um, and again, the worst, I mean, we, we had low appraisal. We had you know, a bank go out of business halfway through the transaction. So we had to restart the process. We had uh, guideline changes. We had issues with titles, with, with title. And fortunately, the other agent owned the property as her property, the listing agent, so that she, she calmed me down more than anything else. I'll, I'll say it that way. But we got all the way to the end of it. It took about five months to get to that closing. Um, and I got a call a month later from Brian literally saying, hey, guess what? I loved it. It was so much fun. I'm doing mortgages now. First, a quick word from our sponsor, Real GTV, real estate agent lead generation television. Need more referrals? Get a free script and simple three part plan used by a top agent to receive and close 74 referral transactions in one year. Just go to freereferralscript.com. That's freereferralscript.com. Now, back to the show. Okay. Okay. So I decided to stick with it. And, um, after that, uh, sold my, so I sold around three or 4 million a year, maybe somewhere in that range. Um, almost five, close to five enough that, that, that I didn't myself doing anything else. I was having a blast. I was really enjoying my job. Um, really enjoying, enjoying the career path that I was on. Um, you know, it did just, again, being frank, I was netting, uh, netting over a hundred a year. And for a 24, 25 year old kid, that's, that's definitely not bad. Um, it was all referral based. Um, I gotten fairly decent at my job. So it was, it wasn't a lot of transactions. It was only, only maybe 13 or 14 a year, but they were all a good price. They were semi luxury for Metro Detroit, semi luxury, not like California, semi luxury. That's different. Um, and then the crash happened. And in 07, it happened here a little bit earlier because of the automotive situation. So we were around six or eight months ahead of, of the rest of the nation. So like CNN, um, Fox, NBC, MSNBC, um, I don't know, wherever the financial news networks are, all of them were still putting out there how crazy amazing the real estate market was on a national level, causing a lot of my semi-luxury clients, let's call it 450 to, to 750 crowd, to come back and say to my, to me, hey Mike, how, how come you're telling me the prices are falling when this is all I see on the news? Um, which was also the same year I decided to actually, actually really make a go at, at building a big business. Um, previous to that year, I had not sold more than 15 homes in any year. Um, from June 1st to, what was it, May 30th of that year, I listed 42 properties. I decided to make a real hardcore dive at expired listings 
Um, I wasn't being coached by anybody. So I kind of had to make it up myself. I didn't realize, I didn't understand the value of coaching. So I went after literally just door knocking. So I would door knock six properties a day. Um, generally I would talk to one person every two people I talked to, I secured a listing. So I could get a listing a week as long as I knocked 12 doors a week. Those are my numbers. Um, I've got a little bit of C in me, so I, I kind of track all that stuff. Um, in May, the bottom fell out and properties stopped selling um, as a brokerage. And we were the biggest, we, and still are the biggest broker in the area from a business perspective, uh, like closed number, closing units, all that. Um, we saw our showings dry up by almost 70% over four weeks, which I didn't know what to do. I had no skill. I didn't know how to talk away through a price reduction. I didn't know how to calm a seller down when I myself was freaking out. I was looking to my sellers and saying, hey, I'm freaking out. Tell me it's going to be okay. You guys have more real estate experience than I do if you bought and sold five, three or four homes. Um, I ended up dumping my inventory and giving it all over to another agent in the office and just taking referral fees because I didn't know what to do. Um, I ended up signing up for two coaching programs at the same time. Um, one marketing, just trying to save me, frankly, uh, one marketing based and one was prospecting based. Um, the marketing based one almost put me in bankruptcy. Um, I mean, it was, it was pretty close to the point that I had to hide my car so they wouldn't take it pretty close to the, <laughs> to the bank. Um, the prospecting route saved me just absolutely saved me. So I got really good at, at the phone work, you know, calling the expires, the for sale by owners, uh, doing some circle prospecting here and there to fill in the gaps, um, getting better about my sphere prospecting. Even I had a very, very, very regimented schedule all the way up to 2012. You know, I was never in the office later than 7 a.m. You could literally set your clock by me. I mean, at, at 6.59, the door was opening. Um, 7 to 7.30, I was preparing for my appointments for the day, whatever I had, market analysis, paperwork, all of that. 7.30 to 8, um, I was preparing my call lists. And at 7.59 and 50 seconds, I started the dials. I literally just started hammering the phones. New expires for one hour, old expires for one hour, for sale by owners for one hour, and then follow up for one hour. And that worked amazing. That was, that was amazing. I was booking one to two, I was booking seven to eight listing appointments per week at that point, which was good. You know, and then as well, my coach also helped me uh, uh, kind of skill up around price reductions, skill up around keeping people calm wrong around long listing times. Um, setting expectations better at the listing appointment that this is not going to be an in and out in 10 days. This is going to be a 90 day marketing time. Um, with myself and one assistant, um, in 2010, I kind of started peeking out where I couldn't do any more, any more business by myself without additional, let's say agents. Um, I closed 183 properties that year. Um, I was good. I was good. I was a 90%, 90% were listings, 10% were buyers. Pretty much every buyer I had and every buyer call, I just kept referring it out to other agents because I, I just wanted to drive those listings as hard as I could. Um, the other thing I did was, I don't know, if this, is this where I, where I should be going? This is fantastic, Michael. I, I'm letting you roll because I'm really enjoying this. This is a great story. Uh, oh. Real quick, who were yeah. the, you said you had a marketing course yeah. and then you had a prospecting course. Who were those with? You bet. Uh, Craig Proctor was my marketing uh, uh, coach, and then uh, Mike Ferry for prospecting. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. that's great. So I'm keep old. going on. Uh, you were you were having a great timeline. I want to get this timeline down. This is such yeah. a great story. So that's you insane. maxed out in what 2010 with yep. 183 units with you and one assistant. I want to. Yep. I just wanted to repeat that. That's phenomenal. And what happened next? Yep. So I went and tried to hire my first buyer's agent, which actually turned out absolutely fantastic. And I will give him a shout out. His name is Brian Davish. He's still in the business, just a different part of the business. Um, and to this day, I mean, much love. I, I, you know, I, I love him like a brother, went to his wedding, all of it. Um, and it was good. You know, he was selling two and a half ish homes a month, ended the year around 32, 33 units, not quite 36. 
But again, he was cherry picking as well because we had so many calls coming in and so many leads coming in off our properties. His average sales price was, was up at four and a quarter, which is amazing. So he's doing about a million a month himself, which is awesome. And I'm thinking, hey, if this is what, a, what having an agent on a team looks like, great, I'll take 10 of them. Um, so I did. And <laughs> it was the time period I went through kind of known as the cream of the crap. Not understanding that motivation is unique. You know, I got really lucky with my first agent on the team, not necessarily purposefully lucky, just kind of accidentally lucky. Um, record down to, to three agents. Brian took off. Brian, uh, Brian partnered up with his brother and actually started flipping, of all things, he started flipping hotels. Go figure. So he'd buy a hotel, revamp it, brand it as a Holiday Inn um, because he had a family connection that owned Holiday Inn franchises already. It would double the value of the hotel and then they'd sell it and they would do one every 18 months. And it was a, it's fantastic. He still does it. Still does it. Today. Um, didn't know that was a thing. Apparently that's a thing. Um, flipping a hotel. But, uh, so I cored back down to like four agents and then that was 2011. Um, and in 2011, I, I knew one thing, the market had, had definitely begun its recovery and was moving in the right direction. Um, I did track my numbers every quarter and I pulled all the data out of the MLS and every quarter I was looking at, at the number of sales in the MLS, the percentage of it that was REO or distressed short sales or just normal sales. And I felt once we got, cause it in, in the Metro trade market, we peaked out around 70% of all closings distressed. But once we got back down to 50, I felt it was go time. If that makes sense. That's kind of just the benchmark I was using. There's no reason to it. And now looking back in time, it made no sense, but it was okay. It worked. Um, it was more my gut feeling. So we hit like 52% in one quarter REO in short and only, and, and as much as 48% regular. And I said, okay, I need to redo my plan. So I did my plan that year um, for 2011 based on, okay, I wanted to do, what was it? 46 million in volume. But the way I did my plan was I said, okay, I want to be, I want to be a farmer originally. So I'm going to do, I'm going to do what it would take to close 46 million in farming. And then I want to go back after my sphere again. Now that times were getting good. So I, I made a plan around what it would take to do 46 million in sphere. And then the same thing for prospecting. Right. Um, because I didn't know which would hit. I had no idea which one of the three would actually work. And it turned out all of them worked enough. So I ended up closing 87 million that year. <laughs> That's a nice win. Yeah. Yeah. That worked, that worked out well. Um, the farming especially worked out extremely well because the down market had knocked out almost every farmer in my area, uh, except for maybe three. Um, and then in Farmington Hills, Michigan, which was the city I grew up in and went to school in. Um, and frankly, nobody was farming it. it, it it's just to the east of Novi. Uh, Novi and Northville average sales price today around 450 at the time, maybe 325, 350 because the market was still kind of, kind of starting to swing. Uh, Farmington Hills was lower at 265 average sales price. And I'm sitting there thinking, man, these are great sales prices. These are great bread and butter homes. I mean, this is easy stuff to sell. Why isn't anybody else farming it? But they all went after the more expensive stuff. I went the other way after the more, I guess not cheaper, but more affordable homes. That's a nice way to put that. That's a good, that's the right way to put that. Um, I ended up uh, uh, topping out at 13 and percent market share in 2013, uh, which we've held over 10% market share with, with minimal effort in Farmington Hills. Um, it, it, it's, we, we've tried to really hard to become a known name. We do a lot with the community, do with, do a lot with the schools, do a lot with, um, you know, philanthropy in the city, all of it. And still to this day, there's no consistent farmer that we really go up against, except for maybe a couple of neighborhood people that where they live in a specific neighborhood and they've lived there for 20 years. So they have half the sales anyway, that kind of a thing. You know, there's a couple of those agents, but for that, that 100,000 person community or 25,000 house community, there's really nobody that really dives after it. Uh, so we've been able to maintain that. Um, 2016-ish, Eh, 15, 16. Um, I really want to dive more into internet lead generation and then also Facebook lead generation, but mostly just trying to drive up my lead count 
and again, this, this is just a facet of me not probably planning as properly as I could. I, I, I said, okay, I really want to go after some leads. I don't exactly know how or where. So I did, and it was good. And all of a sudden, I was generating like 500 leads a month. And at the time, I was like, wow, that's, that's amazing. And the cost was so low, and it was so good. And it's under 20 bucks a lead, and it's so good. And what I didn't know was internet leads definitely convert at a very different rate than, than either farming or sphere, or even prospecting for that matter, when you get an appointment. You know what I mean? I mean, any one of those three, you know, once you get a lead from, at least my experience is, once you get a lead from farming, 90% of the time you're going to a closing. Now, if I can go get in front of an expired or first owner, 60 to 80% of the time, I'm going to a closing. When I get 100 internet leads, I might get four closings if I work hard, like really hard. I didn't know that. So I'm looking at my agents at these 500 leads thinking to myself, oh my gosh, we should have 150 closings a month. What is happening? And no, no, we have like 15 closings a month. Um, so I thought some of my agents were doing a, a not so hot job. So I went and got another coach to coach me up on that before I lost all my agents and drove them all out, which a couple of them out. Um, kind of figured that out and then started figuring out the ISA piece, the inside sales piece at the same time. So we ended up getting, we and, and we have now four, four inside sales associates that just pound the phones all day. Their standard is 800 dials. Um, Three of them right now handle listings. One of them handle buyer appointments. My listing appointment guys are at 23 appointments a month at the standard. My buyer appointment guys are at 46. And I know that that could be higher. I, I know that there are teams out there that'll do 150 buyer appointments a month, but I'm really super picky and focused on the quality of the appointment I'm giving to my agent. You know what I mean? Um, and that was actually a really good team conversation we had back in 15. 16, 16, when I was going into that was, Hey, I'm about to take on, you know, 10 grand a month in salaries plus the bonuses involved. You know, I will give you, I will commit to quality appointments, but it also means we need to change the splits. And they went for it and they're like, great. You mean we don't have to make a hundred dollars a day anymore. We don't have to do 200 dollars a day or 400. dollars Yeah, Mike, that's fine. You mean we could just go show property that, you know, is an appointment booked on our calendar? Great. We'll do that. We're willing to make less to get rid of this pain point, which was something that, that was a good lesson about value. You know, the splits don't actually matter at all for any reason, any reason. It's all about the value and is that agent accomplishing their personal goal? That's it. Everything else, everything else. Um, and actually, the, the person that really taught that to me was uh, was a gentleman in uh, in Texas. His name is Lance Loken, um, which you probably either had on or going to have on or or whatever it is. Um, amazing, I mean, him and him, him and like Karina are just amazing, amazing humans, and have been amazing friends. And I watched what they did with their listing department, going from from let's say a 70, 30, 70 to the to the team, thirty to the agent, and then going and making the same plea and saying, "Hey, if we scale this back." We can hire more admin. We can provide more services. We can get more ISAs, more appointments. We can actually do all the front end work and all the back end work. So your, your, your job is scaled down to simply going on the appointment. You don't even have to do price reductions. You don't have to negotiate contracts. You don't have to do inspections. None of that. We can hire all that away, but we need you to go to, to a 10% split. And they went for it. And for them, it turned out amazing because you've got somebody on their team, as an example, who's very good, um, you know, where she's listing 360, 380 properties a year. And if she's doing all the other stuff, there's no way. So my guys are, are kind of a hybrid in that kind of group model, if you will. Um, and our current model looks like, probably unlike a lot of other teams, um, we do allow our agents to list and buy, and do buy side. Typically speaking, most of my agents gravitate 80% towards one and only 20% towards the other. So a lot of my guys that love buyers and gals that love buyers, they'll do all the buyers, but they'll take the listings they, they get from the buyers. 
So if they have a buyer they're showing at 500,000, but they have a 250 to sell, they'll just take that listing. And they've already built the rapport and all of that. So it becomes a very easy thing. My listing guys and gals that are crushers at that go the other way with it. A lot of their buyers, they refer back to other team members. So they'll do 80% listings and only cherry pick like 20% of the buyers. Very specifically. They're very, they're very strategic on that, which is good. So they naturally float into those categories, although we allow both. Um, the way that we position it is, and it's all based on the agent goal. So everything we do is centered around, okay, what do you want to make per year? So we start there when we sit down and we actually do this three times in the first 90 days because a lot of agents, especially people that are newer to the business, they don't have a great understanding of, of what they want to make because no one, nobody's really asked them that question before in their lives. And they don't understand because outside of real estate, everything is subject to the will of the market for that job, not subject to your own personal will and grit. Does that make sense in a way? Yeah. Yes, so yeah. I get a lot of people that come onto the team that, you know, we're bartenders and let's say they're making 50 or 55 a year and they're great. Their service levels are through the roof and they're like, Hey, if I can make 60 or even 65, I'm happy. And I'm already working 70 hours a week cause I'm bartending. So Hey, anything less than that is a good thing. And I'm sitting there looking at the same person thinking you're a hundred thousand dollar player. And you don't even know it. You don't even know it because in the bartending world, there's no skill up. You just work more hours. You know, eventually you just get to that point where, where you just work more hours and then you're at the will of the, of the restaurant, whatever restaurant you work for to get the job done as far as income goes. Um, so that's the first thing we do with people is we sit down and we say, Hey, how much do you want to make? And if somebody wants to make a hundred thousand on our team, that's around 30 deals, right? With our average sales prices and, and splits and everything else. So then we say, okay, we've got four pillars that we get our business from. Pillar one is sphere of influence. Pillar two is open houses. Pillar three is diving into leads. And then pillar four are ISA appointments. So out of those 30, you're going to need to get roughly nine and a half, let's say 10. Well, I'm sorry, eight, seven and a half, eight from each one. And then we show them the roadmap of what the activities look like that they would need to do with their sphere. So based on the team numbers, you will need to have, to get those eight deals a year, you will need to have around 120 people in your database, as an example, right? And those 120 people, we need you to call once a quarter. We'll do video mailers, we'll send out coupons branded to you, we will do community events branded to you, or client events branded to you. We'll do all of those things branded to the agent on their behalf on the back end, but I need you to make 480 dials per year. That's it, that's all I need you to do. And you'll get your eight closings and you'll make your, you know, 25,000 off of that. Um, open house is same thing. We have a very similar plan set up where we backbone everything except actually being at the house. You know, internet leads, very similar, same thing. We have a virtual assistant that goes through all the internet leads because we don't assign them. We just put them into ponds and they go through and set them all up on searches. And then all the people that are coming back activity wise, we show them how to cherry pick so they're calling the best leads that are within 60 days of a purchase, not just shooting blindly, right? Because we have leads in there from two years ago that are just getting ready to purchase today. And I wanna make sure that the agent knows how to focus on the right lead. And then same thing with the ISA appointments. We put the, we put the appointments right on their calendar. We include as much information as possible, um, as much as for information as possible, including public record, um, any leads in our database that matches that, that home. So they can walk in and say, Hey, Mr. And Mrs. Seller, we probably already have the buyer for your home. You know, I've got nine people in my database looking in your city, in your price range. So let's go ahead and get your home on the market so we can get it for all those nine. And then the other nine we don't know about because they're working with other agents. And that's pretty powerful closing right there. Um, what is your, your uh, financial split arrangement with these agents? Does it vary between whether they're working with a buyer or seller? What, what's the structure there? It does. So on the buyer side, the agent is receiving 45% of the commission. The team is receiving 55. On the listing side, 70-30. Um, 70 to the team, 30 to the agent. And then and that's for team deals. For Sphere the agents are getting 60% on the buyer, 50% on the listing. 
So you're paying yeah. different on the source of the lead. If the yes. lead is coming from the team versus if the lead is coming from the agent. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and then the last part of that is once you hit two years on the team or 12 million in volume, the sphere goes up to 70 on both buyers and listings. So my leadership team itself, we have a director of operations, um, um, what do you call it? a director of sales and then a coach, a launch coach that helps people with, through their first 90 days for the first, let's call it 10 to 12 million. It, there's a, there's a high level of time that goes into the agent. A lot of questions, a lot of questions about radon, a lot of questions about lead, a lot of questions about how to write this addendum, a lot of questions about this and this and this and this, and this, but then somewhere around 10 million, it all goes away. So like I've got an agent on my team that's been with me for almost five years now. I mean, other than our weekly one-on-one, -on -one, there's not a lot that, uh, that, that we put in. And even more so, she's recognized as, as one of the, the kind of heavy hitters on the team. So she, she takes a lot of the leadership burden by answering five or 10 questions a week, which is time gotten back. You know what I mean? You know, traditionally in leadership, you know, you can handle five to 10 humans at a time. We can handle 25 because we're also leveraging out the culture of the team on the other side. And part of the way we, we reward that and then reward longevity and reward somebody being in culture is giving them the higher split back on their sphere. Oh, That's great. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much for uh, giving us that big picture of how the operation works and some of the, the fee structures that people are curious yeah. about. What I'd like to do right now is step back for a minute and go through a quick speed round to get everybody up to date with where you are uh, sure. currently in today, uh, today's market. Um, and so I'm going to ask you just a couple quick questions. Uh, first, what's the name of your team? You bet. It's the Perna team. Um, just my last name, uh, P as in Paul, E-R-N-A, team. And they can find you at the, the pernateam.com, I think, if they wanted to learn more about you. What is your yeah. service area? You bet. Um, all of Metro Detroit and Ann Arbor. Okay, very good. And how long have you been licensed now? I think you just mentioned it. They're almost 20 years? Uh, almost 20 years. Yeah. Almost 20 years. And uh, how many homes did you sell last year? And what was the sales volume? Oh, gosh. We sold uh, just a hair over 600. Uh, sales volume was 103. And that's amazing. Uh, do you recall what the GCI was on that? Um. Oh shoot! I think we were at three eight. Wow, that is fantastic. Yes, three eight one five. And my notes, remember. by the way, had you around one hundred nineteen million last year on the volume. Does that sound right, or was you think it was one hundred and three? You know, I got to be honest. I think it was. I think it was a hundred. I think it could have been one hundred nineteen. Some of the some of their KW reporting. When I pulled it up yesterday when I was answering the question, I was like, that number doesn't seem right, but that's what is reported. It doesn't always include all the expansions. Right. Yeah, you know, I, I was just doing the math for the commissions and the. It just seemed like 120 yeah. is probably your number. But um, let me keep yeah, rolling. I want everybody to get this. I got your average sales price for the whole group is right around 200, 198. Yeah. Does that sound right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, cool. Do you recall today, like last year, what percentage came from buyers versus sellers? You bet. Uh, we're about 55% sellers, 45% buyers. Okay, a little leaning on the seller, but pretty even. Yes. And, um, how many homes, and this is a career stat, uh, how many homes have you sold in your career and do you know what the volume was? Yep, I'm a, I'm a little bit, and actually, actually since, since I, I did a little did, uh, did a deeper dive since, uh, since uh, uh, the, the email form, um, I'm a little bit over 4,000, but I am a little bit over 900 million in, uh, in, in total volume. Almost to that billion dollar mark, that's amazing. Yes, uh, yes, and how many team members do you have in total? Um, we currently have 41 in total, including ISAs, admin, virtual assistants, um, and agents. And could you do us a, this will take a little longer. Could you walk us through the structure of the team? I know it's pretty big, yeah. but people are curious, you know, what are the, the, the titles and what are they responsible for and how many people in each of those positions? Absolutely. Now, a quick word from our sponsor, Real GTV, real estate agent lead generation television where top agents reveal exactly how they create consistent flows of home buyer and home seller leads into their practices every month. Need more leads? Hit the pause button right now 
Open Google and search Real G TV. That's R E A L G dot TV. Now back to the show. So I have a director of sales. He is directly responsible for all of the agents, their training, their education, and their weekly one on ones. I have a director of operations, um, and she's responsible for exactly that, all the back end side of it. Um, and then as well, she's taken on a couple of agents herself to one on one because, frankly, she loves it. She's in love with real estate agents and real estate and all of that. And that's amazing. She started as an agent on the team, became a director of sales for me, and then took over operations. Didn't ask for the job, just took the job. Which, <laughs> yeah, that's what you want. <laughs> um, and then we have a launch coach, Sadie, who she still sells a couple homes a month. Uh, but her job is, is effectively the first 90 days somebody's with us. That's her baby. Um, and again, we're blessed to have her because, you know, we're, we're in a, in a major growth phase. My current coach, we, we did a little bit of an analysis. Um, and right now I have around 20, what do I have? 26 agents and I have the ability to feed 50. So having that launch coach now is critical because we are under, under a massive, massive hiring push. I mean, the goal is to have 50 agents by August 1st. So we got to bring on at least, at least 24 agents to make that number happen. Um, we have a listing coordinator, two closing coordinators, uh, two photographers slash runners on the team. Um, and then the rest are just the agents, not just the agents, but you know, so you have around 20 agents or so right now, and you want to push to 50, you, you're, you want to two and a half times your business. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And that's really interesting. So, um, and you, I, I'm sorry, did you mention your ISAs? I think you have four ISAs. Yeah. Four, four ISAs currently, three of them focused on um, uh, sellers, one focused on buyers. Well, I got to ask as the questions in my head that, you know, we're, we're recording this right in the middle of the coronavirus. We're kind of coming out the other side of it. We think we don't know as far as things are opening up a little bit, but you're very optimistic and you want to continue to expand. What, if you looked in your crystal ball, what are you seeing out there in the future in the market? Well, that's a great question. Um, and my team members ask me the same question quite a bit. And my answer is, I'm going to give you the same answer I give them. The market is going to either go up or it's going to go down. Any way you cut it, it doesn't matter to me. And my tactic will change, but my strategy will always remain the same. Strategy is we get more agents, we get more leads, we get better qualified leads, we do the best we can to provide administrative support, education, and training timed to the market for the agents in a way that frankly, a lot of people, a lot of other people are not doing just as an example. And we will always win. I mean, this, this team was born in the down market. I've been saying for years, I mean, and, and I don't wish any, anything ill on anybody, but I've been saying for years, like, okay, Oh my gosh, that market, I wish we were back in that market. That market was so good. That's where growth happens. And if you look at a lot of the major teams in the U S right now, a lot of that growth did happen during that time. Myself, Jeff Glover, Mark Z, uh, James Schaefer. I mean, just four of us that are crushing out, out over $100 million just in Metro Detroit. Every single one of us, we were, we were forged in the fires of that market. And yet we've all also kind of started topping out in this good market. I think one of, the, one of the biggest challenges that we face as real estate agents today is the lack of confidence in the consumer that they need a professional. A license can list a property and get it sold when there's a two month supply of inventory. Just a license, any license. The person does not necessarily need to be alive. The license itself just needs to be active. And then that's not to be offensive to any real estate agents, but it's the truth. A true professional can affect the sales price of a property by anywhere between two and 10%. And I know because I've done it against other agents. I've negotiated against other agents where I've kind of taken their lunch on a negotiation for my client. And my client didn't even know I was doing it. I just did it. And then came back and said, hey, guys, you know that offer that was uh, down here that you told me to go ahead and accept? Yeah, I moved it up. I moved it up 30000 Oh, by the way, I got your free occupancy and appraisal waiver and this and this and this. You know what I mean? And had the agent fought back even a little I would, have, I would have let a lot of that go because my seller had instructed me to go ahead and accept the offer, but I knew that there was more, more meat on that bone without losing the deal. You know, the, the time of the true professional, I think, needs to come back. 
and probably will only come back, at least in the consumer's mind, just like it did in the last market, when things get tough. You know what I mean? In that last recession, in, in it was the Great Recession, and things were pretty yeah. nasty there for a while, and you got hit early. Uh, did you ever sell REO or short sell properties, or were you working uh, strictly on the retail side? I worked retail. Um, about 10% of my business was short only because it was referred to me. And I never turned down a referral. I never turned down a past client. So I had to, had to move into that space a little bit. Um, but I was very convinced that this was a short term, not a long term thing. Like, no matter, like, I look back at, at the other Great Recession and I said, okay, that lasted about 10 years. Right? Things move a lot faster today than they did back then. So we'll probably be in this for about five years. Fair? And sure enough, we were in and out in three and a half years. And we were on, on the path to recovery in three and a half, three and a half years. Now, if I recall from your story in the last Great Recession, you went pretty heavily into expireds. You said that's kind of what saved you was the heavy prospecting into expireds, working with yeah. your coach, Mike Ferry, and it kind of worked out. Uh, you've continued to work expireds even in a stronger market. Uh, what is your uh, approach to expireds? How have you been so successful with them? You betcha. And that's a great question. So we use a mixture of um, calling and mailing. Uh, the door drop-offs we kind of play around with, but we haven't had uh, huge success with that unless we knock the door, uh, which a couple of my agents do. Um, with the calling, it's just a real simple redirect away from the house and towards the future pacing of where they were going to go. You know, Hey Mike, it's Mike with Keller Williams giving you a call. I saw your home over on one, two, three main street was taken off the market, uh, unsold had the, and then I just redirect had the home sold. Where would you and your family be right now? Well, we wanted to go buy the vacation house up in Traverse city and retire up there and stuff like that. Oh, what's taking you to Traverse city? Well, they've got great barbecue and the lakes and the boats and the, this like great. Do you have grandkids? Actually we do. Is that a motivator for getting up there is to have a place for the grandkids to go and, and do the things in the water sports? Well, yeah, absolutely. Cool. Could you picture yourself there? Because I could picture you there. Well, yeah, I can. I'm like, great. Let me get you there. I'm going to be in your neighborhood tomorrow at five o'clock showing a property. As soon as I'm done with that, why don't I pop by for 15 minutes at six? If I could sell your house, fantastic. I'll tell you. If I can't get it sold, I will tell you that too. Because we spend a ton of money marketing properties. I'm not going to take on a property that I can't sell. So I'll see you tomorrow at six for 15 minutes. Sound good? And that's cool. pretty much the entire script. It's that short. How, how often when you use that script do you set an appointment? What percentage of the time? Uh, about 30%. So about one in three of the people that you talk to with that script, you're going to set yourself an appointment. I think you mentioned earlier your success rate with expires. When you get there is 60% plus, maybe as high as 80%. Yes. Wow, that is fantastic. What a great concept. You, I think you mentioned the word future pacing. Yep. I want to put their minds back into the future of where they would go because buying something is fun. I mean, I mean, it, it, for everybody that's watching this later on, think about it. In the last 24 hours, how many of you, you guys were not on Amazon in the last 24 hours? In the last seven days, how many of you guys have looked at something around your house and said, man, I should probably sell that on Craigslist or get rid of it or donate it or something, but it just didn't happen. Selling stuff sucks. Buying things are fun. I want to put them back into the mindset of the fun and then connect that fun to me and the appointment to get them to the fun. Whatever that is. Oh, that's fantastic. That was brilliant. A great scripting. I uh, also like how you showed that you were busy. I'll be in the area on a, a showing appointment. In other words, I'm active in the market. I'm doing things, uh, taking action. There, it was really a power packed script that you had there. Uh, and then you mentioned you also are sending out mail. What kind of things are you sending out to them? Great question. So we're sending a two page letter, letter going into what their previous agent probably did we just stick a sign on the ground, maybe do an open house, and then get on their hands and knees and pray to God somebody else brings them a buyer. Goes into our marketing, which includes all the social medias, the 3D tours, all of that. And again, just asking for 15 minutes of their time. I'm really big on the 15 minutes because when I get there, it's not 15 minutes, it's an hour and a half to three hours. 
I was going to ask how you were getting it all in in 15 minutes. <laughs> well, I mean, 15 minute increments, but like nine of them. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's just to get right. your foot in the door and get things started. You might have to leave after 15 minutes if it's not working, correct? That's right. That's right. Um, and then the other thing we put in is we put in a little, a little booklet. It's a, it's a six pager, which I try to focus on. And what, I, what essentially what I did was I took the NAR real estate profile of sellers, skipped all the way to the back, which I think is usually around page 108 or 112. I read it every year, even though the data doesn't change, which is funny. I don't know why I keep reading it. Uh, data hasn't changed in 20 years, but they still put it out and I still read it. Um, you know, number one complaint from consumers, communication. Number two complaint, the agent didn't market the home. Literally, that's it. So I spent three of the eight pages on communication directly up front. I set a communication standard and a guarantee. I played around with multiple guarantees through the years, and I found the one that actually works the best is very simple. Every single week on Thursday between noon and four, I call every single one of my sellers and give them an update going into the weekend. Anytime I don't, I'm going to cut 200 bucks off the commission because it's realistic. You know, I see some of these guarantees out there that some of these agents put out there. Um, like I'm not trying to be offensive because, because some of them work very well depending on the market, but in some, in, in my market, people are a little more skeptical. So when it's the, Hey, if I don't sell your house in 30 days, I'll buy it. Right. It depresses, in the agents that use it at a high level here, not everywhere, not everywhere, because I have some friends that use it at a high level outside of Metro Detroit, and they do very well with it, so I don't want to speak negatively against that in a different market. But in my market, it basically takes your average sales price down and guarantees it to be 150 or below. Because people at the four, five, 600 crowd, or in that crowd, look at that and they say, okay, there's gotta be a lot of fine print, they're gonna try to take advantage of me, they're gonna try to bamboozle me, all of it. But if I keep it something as that simple as, hey, I'm going to shave 200 bucks off each and every time I don't return that call or I don't call you. Now that's achievable. And somebody's like, okay, nobody wants to lose 200 bucks. I don't want to lose 200 bucks. Mike's not going to want to lose 200 bucks. He's going to return my call. No, that's, simple. that's really good. That's very strong. I like how you're using a guarantee. It's almost like you you mixed in a little, little of the proctor information that you learned early on, some of that marketing. Yeah. And your yeah. prospect and you You've created your own ball of wax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, and and just to be completely upfront, you know, in my career, I've had nine coaches. I'm currently being coached. Um, it, it is 100% the highest ROI of anything I've ever done in my career, period. And sometimes I see people say, you know, and as a, you know, and I've coached before. I, I, I coached for an organization for a short period of time. And I've heard people say, you know, hey, you know, when, when times get tough, the first thing I'm cutting is the coaching is like, no, cut the leads first, cut everything else first. Because with, with, with this, I can make a million bucks a year. Just this, nothing else, nothing else, literally nothing else. But people don't understand that. And I, I personally believe that whatever... And, and I see people, you know, you see it online, you see it on, on the Facebooks, on the, on the Insta Twitters and all that stuff in the chats and the whatnot, that the value of coaching keeps getting depressed. And I think it's quite the opposite. I mean, it, it I mean, I, I know somebody right now that pays that, that coaches with, with uh, John Maxwell personally, right? She pays 25 grand a month and she consistently says, it's the best check she writes every month. Think about that. 25 grand a month for a one hour a week phone call. Really? But if the value's there, it's priceless. It doesn't matter. There's no higher ROI I've ever had in my career than simply put coaching. You mentioned at one point you hired a coach to help you with internet leads. Who was that? Yes. Um, Oh gosh, uh, Bob Corcoran. Bob so Corcoran yep. had a lady specifically on his staff that actually she she now works for a different coaching company. Um, 
and gosh, I don't remember her name off the top of my head, but I coached with her for about nine months to get me in line there with my follow-ups and resetting my expectations and having to change my scripting and dialoguing around everything and the number of times I had to follow up and how hardcore I had to be, all of it. Um, I will say Bob is, is a very good, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, systems coach. Like that is where I think he truly shines is, I mean, he's very, bra he's very brash, he's very <laughs> direct. If he thinks you're messing it up, he's just going to call you and pound you into the ground on it. And I love that. Um, but one thing where he truly shines is, is systems set up, operations. He does a great job with that. And I needed, I needed some sort of operational help with how to deal with this for at that time. To, to me, at that time, at that exact moment, 500 leads a month was over 10 times what I was getting two months before that. I had no idea how to handle that flow. I didn't even have a volume. Uh, who's your coach today? Uh, John Chiplack. Okay. And I'll tell you, he, he puts me on the ground every week, every week. I mean, this, this last coaching call from yesterday is, is no exception. Like, and, and I, I'm also, I mean, this sounds really bad, but, I've, but he's one of the few coaches I've gone into with almost no expectations. And he puts me on the ground and I've got five weeks of homework. Cause he finds all the problems really quick in like three questions and then spends the next 27 minutes showing me how to fix them all, which is cool. That's fantastic. Uh, real quickly, you mentioned that you went into geographic farming and you've had a lot of success there, 10% more market share. What are you doing in your geographic farm? First of all, how big is it? Uh, how'd you pick it? And then what kind of message are you sending into it? How often? Great question. And uh, some of this data you probably heard before by other agents. It's always good to hear it again. So I'll just keep going over what everybody else has probably gone over, like over the last 20 episodes on farming. Because, um, I mean, the science doesn't change, right? Success leaves clues. And they're probably the same clues along a lot of the webinars. Um, so first thing I was looking at was competition, right? Because I started on a neighborhood level and I was willing to pick three neighborhoods, a thousand homes. That's it. That that's at the time I was like, okay, that's what I'm going to start with. And then I rapidly expanded it up to 26,000 homes, which is, which is what it is right now. Um, I want it easy. And at the time, EDDM, every door direct mail, which is easily Googleable, Googleable, it had just come on the scene and it was like, oh, my savior, no more barcoding, no more prepping weirdness. And then it all get, got sent back to my office half the time because the, Local postmaster didn't want to deal with me and blah, 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 blah. Great. Okay, good. EDDM, every door direct. It's cheap. I think it's what, about 17 and a half cents right now, 18 cents, whatever it is. Um, and it literally just carpet bombs an entire mail carrier's route. And even though I was hitting a thousand homes in that neighborhood, I had to mail around 1,200 to hit the thousand, which was still cheaper than doing metered mail. Still cheaper than, than bulk mail or third class or whatever you want to call it, right? Um, I did a very basic 12 direct. Um, the postcards were eight and a half by 11. So essentially a full sheet of paper, a uh, 14 point uh, stock with a UV coat. So they were also very thick, like a notebook cover thick, right? Like a mead, mead uh, notebook cover thick. Um, they stuck out in the mail compared to everything else. You couldn't miss them, which was great. Um, when I went after my farm, you know, and, and I, this is one of those things I probably shouldn't say, but I am going to go ahead and say it because that's what I feel like. I wanted to test my theory that I could beat another agent in their own farm. And this agent had 70% uh, market share, had been there for over, had lived in the neighborhood for over 30 years. Guys, I don't recommend doing this. Don't, don't do this. Look for somebody, look for a farm that has, if possible, a 7% or higher turnover. Settle for five, but don't go below five, period. Because there are some neighborhoods in my area and probably your area as well, where they have a 2% turnover or a 3% turnover. So out of every 100 homes, you've only got two opportunities or three opportunities to get a check. Just being completely blunt. With my 7% market share, I've got seven opportunities to get a check. So if I can get 60% of the seven, that's a heck of a lot better than 60% of the two. Simply put. Second, I would definitely go into a neighborhood where no one has over a 20% market share. And both those numbers, the turnover rate and the market share, 
I would run straight backwards for three years. Not one, not two, but three. And here's the reason. Sometimes sales will dip or be artificially high in a neighborhood because sometimes, like, like my own neighborhood where I grew up, right? Typically had around a three to 4% turnover for 20 some odd years. But then in one year, it had a 15% turnover because all the people that, that built in 84, all those kids graduated and all those people all sold one year later, including my parents and they moved. And then it went back down to 3%. Right. So if I was using that one year, if I was using the wrong year as my base model data, I would have farmed the wrong neighborhood for years to spend tens of thousands of dollars going after way too, way too few potential sales. So I would go back three years. The reason for the 20% is you'll have to outspend that person two or three or sometimes even four to one to displace them as the number one in the mind share. And it's not worth it. How about now, the message on the card? What were you sending as yeah. far as the message? Uh, same thing I sent today, just sold. So I send, it's a just sold, right? So it's got the house. It's in Farmington Hills. I've got a picture of the humans holding up the sold sign. People love the humans. I've got the quote on the bottom, the testimonial. And then anything unique about that sale, free occupancy, saving them $4,600. Um, sold 11 grand above appraised value sold in two days at 103% list to sales price highest price per square foot in the neighborhood because at that moment these are your habit mats and people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care and they have no idea how much you care because they've never met you so right now they're all listening to the same radio station what's in it for me WYFL so they want to know can this guy Get my family the best value, the best money, the highest sales price, whatever that looks like. You know, protect my equity. And can they make it as stress-free as possible? That's it. That's what people want to know, right? So evidence of success with the sold, the stress-free in the review, and the money in the stat. Just nailing the psychology of it. And then once you're in front of them, then you start into your Ford conversation right? Family, occupation, recreation, dream. And that's where you win the hearts and the minds. Go because ahead. then they like you and then they sign with you. That was powerful. I hope everybody was listening to that. What a, what a great outline card. As you said, evidence of success. I'd written down proof of success. Well, what a great way to attack it. And I like how you're going after the, the different mindsets. Uh, we're starting to run a little low on time, but I, I want to get a couple quick questions mm -hmm. out. One question is, um, profitability. You've got all these people running around and people, agents are listening. They're wondering if you, you're profitable or not. Are you profitable? Yes. Uh, we vacillate between a 22 and, a, and about a 31, 32% profit margin right now. Um, I know it's not the 40% that Gary wants in his book, Millionaire Real Estate Agent. However, um, it tends to go low when I'm on growth mode. Because and this is just my own personal belief. I tend to hire the back end first. I get the admin in place. I get the system beefed up, including lead generation, ISAs, all of that. And then I go hire my next round of agents, so to speak. So I usually grow by five to eight agents at a time. So I stack up my expenses, unfortunately. And then the agent sales will follow 120 days later and put me back up over that 30% mark. That's because you have a lot of confidence in what you're doing. A lot of people would want to build the sell side out first to prove that they have sales before they build, bring in the admin. You're building up that admin first so that they can handle the additional sales, and that shows a lot of confidence. Um, another quick question here is, you know, I'm listening to you, and you're, you're very driven. What drives you? I can tell you the goal of every single person on my team, one, three, and five years. And I love it when they nail it. I love it when they nail it. Now, I've got an agent on the team that her goal was, and she accomplished, to buy her parents a house because they got wiped out during the down market, lost their, uh, their restaurant, have had health issues ever since, his, her father has. And her single primary goal was, I want to buy, buy a ranch home for 250 to 300 for cash. And she did. I have another agent on the team that wanted to be a, a first-time homeowner. And over the, over the course of two years, not only did, did they achieve that goal, but she bought the house for cash, right? I have another husband and wife on the team that they want to have a life worth living where she was a school teacher before and her and her husband 
I mean, they, they do well, right? I mean, even, even, even with the school teacher salary, which is not wonderful, you know, Scott's salary is, 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 is very nice, but it still wasn't going to achieve the goals of the private school and the college fund and having the, having the home they want to live in, in the city they want to live in without her making a move into real estate. But now that she's had her first, she's been on the team for four and a half years, she wants to peel back to, hey, I want to spend two and a half days a week working and the rest of the time with my daughter which is fantastic. So we set her up in a way that she can still do seven, eight million a year in sales and only do appointments on two days a week, right? We're showing agents showing, showing assists. There is no one on my, on my team that I don't know their goals and I don't love on them and push them to get to them. No one. Michael, you've grown into this position. I want to flash you back in a quick second here to 2010 when you closed 183 homes with one assistant, what was yeah. driving you back then? I wanted to be number one. I wanted to win. I had two different brokers tell me I was going to be out of the business. One of them still gets a Christmas card from me because I now <laughs> do quadruple the sales of his brokerage. I mean, when somebody tells me I'm going to fail, then I have to win. I mean, that's just <laughs> how it works, right? Like, that's what you do. You know, then it just becomes like, you know, what do you do? Anything it takes. Anything. You know, you're, you're, you're at the gym at 4.30 in the morning, so you could be at the office at 7, so you can work till 11 and sleep for three hours and then hopefully catch that up Sunday morning somewhere and go off of 25 hours of sleep a week if you, if you, can, if you can handle it. You know, you do whatever it takes. To, and it wasn't even about crushing my competitor as far as taking any market share from him because we were actually like two different markets technically, even though I was at his brokerage for a while. It was just about going to his level and then doubling it and then sending him a Christmas card and said, hey, man, I see that you had a really good year at this level. By the way, I did this much last year. Not that I would ever do that. Not that I would, I mean, more than six or seven times at least. You're very competitive. Uh, yes. If there is an agent listening to us and they're just getting in the business, what would you advise them to do first? Absolutely. That's a great question. Um, the very first thing I, I would do, actually, if, if you're looking for business, the very first thing I would do is call every single person on your phone, call every single person in, in Facebook that you have as, as a friend, because they should actually be friends and not just agents across the world at that point. Um, find everybody in your Google and start just a very basic sphere campaign and then just go straight to it. Hey, Mike, it's Mike with Keller Williams. Guess what? I've got some big news. I just switched careers in the real estate. And this is a business call. You know, I got to ask as a realtor now, who do you know that I should know? That's thinking about buying, selling, or investing in real estate. No one. Great. How are the kids? How is this going? How's your work going? Did you get that promotion? What happened with this project you were working on? And then ask for the business right up front and go straight into a Ford conversation for 15 minutes after that. If you can do that to the 250 people that are currently in your phone, and there are 250 in there, whether you think there are or not, there are you're going to come out with your first half a dozen to a dozen deals immediately in real estate. From there, that should fund you to go get a coach to work on the other pieces of the business because a great real estate business has three legs. The sphere are people that already know you and like you and are willing to take a shot on you, especially if you have a great brokerage behind you that can help catch you and they know that. Um, then you can use that to fund your coaching to go into expires or farming or internet lead generation or, 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 or. That's what I would do if I was going to do it over again. Oh, that's powerful. It's powerful. Well, Michael, this has been so much fun. I've come to the end of my questions for today. Do you have any parting thoughts for the listeners? Yes. I'm trying to think of what, what, how, to, how to phrase this. I think the one thing I will say is, is the definition, in my opinion, the definition of a great agent or a poor agent is not defined at all one iota by business. How much is sold? It's defined by how you treat each other, how you treat the clientele, how you treat the vendors, you know, the mortgage people out there. You know, return calls, guys, it means a lot and goes a long way. Those memories by co op agents, they're long. You can win deals on a multiple offer negotiation, multiple offer situation, or lose them just as easily by how you reacted on a situation three years ago. I'm not even kidding. Um, I would say always keep your calm, always work and act with grace. Never throw anybody under the bus. It's not worth it. Be the professional. Think about the perfect co-op agent you've ever worked with. Be that person. 
You know what I mean? That one thing I don't think anybody really ever talks about, and I think it's a shame. I think sometimes people think about big numbers and think people think of people talk about you know businesses where people are are in lights somewhere or on a stage somewhere, but we forget the guy who again in Farmington Hills and is a good friend. He's been selling real estate for ten years longer than I've been alive. Never goes more than three hours without without a return phone call. Is pleasant to work with. Is a consummate professional. Not the most chitty chatty in the world, but I'll tell you what. I see his offer come across the desk versus three others. His is the one that gets accepted every time. He's going to get it done and it's going to be a, a working together relationship, not an entrapment, not rude, not any of that. I think we're missing that in the business a little bit. Personal opinion, personal opinion. Yeah. Uh, very good. Very good, Michael. Well, again, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for coming in and taking the time to talk with us today. Absolutely, Mike. And no, and thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And and I hope that was was that was that what you were looking for a little bit? That was fantastic. It's fantastic. Okay. You're gonna help a lot of folks. Uh, again, thank you so much. And by the way, anybody listening, if you've got a referral for someone going in or out of Detroit, Michigan, you be sure to give Michael a call. He's gonna take really good care of those folks. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for talking with us. Absolutely. No, and thank you. And likewise, I appreciate you having me on the show and, and, and taking the time. I, I appreciate it. I really do. I love it. It's so much fun. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Michael. Well, that's it for now. We'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for joining us on Success Calls. Keep moving forward. Bye. If you like the show and want to know when the next one's coming out, click the subscribe button. And if you want to hear more episodes like this, give the show a five-star review and write a quick comment. I read them all, and it motivates me to keep going and share the top agent success stories with you. Thanks. If you're looking for more ways to generate leads, check out our sponsor, Real GTV, real estate agent lead generation television, and their giant database library of video trainings where top agents reveal, demonstrate, and discuss their best lead generation methods. Visit RealGTV, R-E-A-L-G dot TV. If you're low on funds or just want to get the maximum leverage, check out my masterclass webinar titled Top 5 Free Lead Sources for Real Estate Agents. Learn more at FreeLeadTime.com. That's FreeLeadTime.com. Oh, and if you have a real estate friend who needs some inspiration, tell them about the Success Calls podcast. And don't you forget to subscribe right now to hear all the great top agent ideas. Keep moving forward. You've been listening to Success Calls on the Mastermind Agent Network, where top real estate agents from across North America reveal their success secrets, strategies, and systems in up-close and personal interviews. You can find all the calls at www.mastermindagent.com.